Okay, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Willem. I'm a tech lead on the data science platform team at Gojek. Uh, I'm joined here today with Jeremy Lewy, who's the co-creator of Kubeflow. Um, today, we're going to be talking a bit about um, building ML platforms on top of Kubernetes. The two messages I want you guys to take away from the talk is, firstly, Kube and Kubeflow are great platforms to build ML platforms on and to run ML workloads on. And then secondly, Feast, one of the open source projects that we developed at Gojek, along with Kubeflow, allows you to rapidly iterate on models. So the agenda, just in brief, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Gojek story from where we started with Kubernetes and um, how we built our platform on top of it and why that make, made sense. We're going to have a quick demo on Feast as well as with uh, Kubeflow and fairing specifically on building and deploying a model. And then we're going to, uh, Jeremy's going to catch you guys up on some of the latest happenings in Kubeflow and talk a bit about Kubeflow. So who is Gojek? Gojek is an Indonesian technology startup. Uh, we're most famous for ride-hailing on motorcycles. Um, but since launching that product a few years ago, we've branched out into many different other products, ride-hailing in cars, um, taxis, food delivery with GoFood, um, dig digital payments with GoPay, um, logistics with GoBox and GoSend. In total, we have about 18 different products um, in 15 different verticals, and all together, they form one super app. And the goal of this app is to have a solution for every workday, workday need that you have. Just to give you an indication of the kind of scale. Um, so we originally started in Indonesia, but since then we've branched out into many different markets, so Singapore, Vietnam, Thailand. Uh, in one of our products, the ride-hailing product, we have about 2 million drivers on the platform, and we process about 100 million bookings uh, every month, or more than 100 million bookings every month. Uh, in GoFood, we're one of the largest food delivery services in Southeast Asia, and excluding China, one of the largest in, in Asia, with over 400,000 merchants on our platform. And then um, third, uh, the GoPay uh, the product we have is also one of the fastest growing digital wallets. So the scale is quite large, and the ability for us to influence um, the, the business through machine learning and data science systems is quite immense. And at the heart of that is data. And I hope this renders correctly, but this is an animation of um, one of our services, Go Ride, in, throughout one day in uh, Jakarta. And each pixel is a person being picked up or dropped off um, on, on a motorcycle. So you can imagine the amount of data we have and the amount of transactions uh, and the amount of ML um, or the scope for machine learning and data science to make an impact here. But when we started, we didn't really have a platform or anything to build on top of. So as a data science platform lead, we were tasked with, or a data science platform team, we were tasked with uh, deciding on what, what to build our platform on. Right? Do you use a managed service? Do you build from scratch? Do you use something that abstracts that away like Kubernetes? So we looked at the problem space and opportunities in the company. And what we saw was a, a similar trend like this, where there, there was two types of problems, basically. The first was you had opportunities to, um, for the platform to affect model creation for data scientists that were ephemeral, offline. Um, maybe they were just going to be used for an, an, an analysis or a, a small project that never gets into production. So that's on the left-hand side over here. But there were also these high-impact um, pro projects that were your core decision systems, essentially. So a pricing engine or a driver allocation engine or the food recommendations on the home page or any kind of search engine within the application. Um, so from the perspective of a platform that we had to build, we had to satisfy both of these orthogonal objectives. One is provide an abstraction for the users that makes it easy for them to quickly iterate and build models. And the other one is that the platform should be able to uh, integrate with our production engineering systems, and it should cater for all uh, the, the requirements of those systems and handle the scale and, uh, and be extensible uh, and uh, flexible. So given these two orthogonal constraints, we decided to focus on the most impactful use cases at the start. We'd build our platform um, based on uh, one specific project and, and then take it from there and add, incrementally add more systems and projects to it. And so the one we decided to start with was the driver allocation use case. So 
this is a system that takes a list of drivers in the customer and then decides which driver to send to that customer. And the volume of transactions that is processed by one of these, or, or this system itself, is very high. So hundreds of, more than 100 million bookings every month. So uh, it has a very high ability to affect the bottom line of the business. And based on the requirements and our knowledge of the complexity of the system and the importance of the system, we knew it would be engineering heavy. Um, so we, just, we opted based on our understanding of the ML landscape to build our platform on Kubernetes. And originally, it was mostly because of the dependence, dependency management aspects of it, because our data scientists were already using Docker for their containers um, and uh, packaging up their dependencies. But we also got benefits like container orchestration and process isolation. So basically, what the system did was uh, we'd use a very basic Airflow pipeline to train a model and deploy that model in a web service to uh, a container running in Kubernetes. It would get in a request, which is a list of drivers in the customer. It would enrich that with some data, and then it would give a response on which driver to send to the customer. And this had an incremental gain, um, and it did pr improve our bottom line, but it wasn't that spectacular. And uh, one of the concerns was uh, the learning curve of Cube. And so we were always questioning at the start, was going for Cube the right decision? Uh, but over time, it proved to be uh, indeed the right decision. So immediately it started paying dividends when we needed to add experimentation. So when we started deploying multiple models into our Kubernetes cluster, we needed a way to manage traffic to these models. So we built a very rudimentary experimentation user interface for our data scientists so that they can configure traffic splits to these models. And one of the benefits of Kubernetes was that it provided a, a standardized control plane for us to build on top of. So we could loosely couple our ingress and our traffic manager, which is in the cluster, to a configuration user interface that's updating that config map. And then we could just templatize the Nginx configuration. And then and there, there we had traffic splitting and uh, experimentation. So, so really, this is one of the key value adds that Kubernetes brings when you're building a platform on top of Kubernetes. The second value add was on orchestration. So already here, we're seeing that the system is getting a little bit more complex. So what we found was that it's very rare to actually have just a model in a web service uh, serving these responses and actually doing a good job. What we found is that you actually need many different models ensemble together to have a valuable output. And so we built an orchestrator called Lasso. Um, and if, if you want to look for an alternative in the open source world, there's Selden that you can also look at. But basically, you define a workflow or a graph. And this graph can do things like call multiple models and take the most confident response, or uh, call two models. And maybe one is fast and accurate, but one is uh, not. Uh, it's maybe, sorry, one is slow and, ac uh, slow and accurate, but the other one's fast and not accurate. So if the one is taking too long to respond, then take the other one. Uh, so you can do all of these complex logic. Um, and that was really a big value add, and that dramatically improved the Im impact of the system. Um, and then at the, at the end of the day, you're also experimenting on multiple versions of these. So Kubernetes helped us here because you have an uh, execution environment that's shared between all of these services. So running these graphs are really efficient. And at the end of the day, you're version controlling this uh, inference graph with your manifest for Kubernetes. And you can see and get your whole system and how it's going to operate in clear text. Then there were some other benefits to running on Kube, and it was economies of scale. So we also started to standardize across the company on Kubernetes. So it wasn't just the data science or the ML teams. And a lot of the benefits were, were being felt by our team by what the other teams were, were building. So in one case, we wanted to log the incoming requests to our services. But because of the performance uh, constraints, it was actually too hard to do this ourselves. We couldn't just log to the console. So one of the teams built a logging sidecar. And basically, you deploy this as a daemon set. And all of your services can just log to a port on their local host. And the, the logs and the metrics are then streamed off to some uh, stream like PubSub or Kafka. Uh, but, but of course, we benefited from many other um, systems and components that were built by the other teams in, within Gojek. One of the things that I wasn't showing earlier was the f that there are these databases actually with, deployed with the models. And these databases are, for example, Redis pods that have data loaded into them through um, uh, the jobs that are executed within the Kubernetes environment. So, um, they'll take, for example, a data set off of GCS and load it into a Redis and then just finish their execution. 
And then this Redis contains all the features for that specific model um, to actually do its inference, because the request needs to be enriched with those features. Um, so we really benefited in terms of running workloads on Kubernetes because of the fact that you, you had the jobs API um, and intelligent resource scheduling. And you could easily deploy a feature consumer that just auto scales and, and pulls in real time features into these Redis pods. Um, and what we're moving towards now is using Kubeflow pipelines to orchestrate a lot of this, these jobs. Um, so it abstracts away a lot of the pains that we had there. Um, it, it can intelligently schedule, for example, a workload that needs a GPU, and it finds the right node with the right amount of memory to run your compute. So ML on, on Cube really benefits from its capabilities in terms of workloads. But one of the inefficient parts here was the duplication of uh, features within these um, Redis pods. So we were having a lot of issues and a lot of pain around feature engineering. Data scientists would reinvent the same features across projects, across teams. Um, there was an inconsistency between the feature transformations for streams and for batch. One is in Python, one is in Java. And this is a very common problem in, in data science or in uh, ML systems. So we knew there was a hotspot that we wanted to fix. And so we looked at um, building a feature store for this. So there are two, two basically roles or personas that use a feature store. The, on the one side, you have the data creators. They're, they're creating data sets from raw data. They're creating transformations in batch. And they're, they're creating stream transformations. And they're publishing it in some stream. And then you have a user of that data that wants to train a model um, and somehow serve that model. Um, so what we ended up building was a store that allows you to ingest these features, either real time or batch. Um, and they get stored in, uh, from these streams into two stores. One is a feature warehouse. In our, our case, that's BigQuery. The other is a, um, a serving store, which can be either Bigtable or Redis, depending on your requirements. And what this provides to the end user, the ML engineer, is a consistent API to both of these stores. So they define a feature set, and then they can query from the feature warehouse over a time range historical feature data, train their model, take their model into production, and then use the same feature set to query real time features in serving. And so this eliminates the serving training skew. Um, it ma means you can manage your features centrally, so you don't have duplication between teams, and they can discover features that are in use. And it also means you don't need to roll out new databases for each um, model that gets deployed. So, one of the, so this is how the architecture changes when you have a feast serving deployment. So you'll just deploy that feast serving within the same cluster, with, which is managing your production workload. And of course, you could have deployed that anywhere. That could have been a managed service, or it could be on a VM. But ultimately, one of the benefits to Kubernetes and running ML systems is that you can deploy everything basically in one cluster. So if you have a page you're going off at 2 AM, you can just look at your one cluster to get a complete overview of, of all the issues that are happening there and debug that. So from an operational standpoint, there's a big benefit to standardizing on Kubernetes for, for these ML systems. And then we had a rapid expansion. So we were deploying more and more models and systems, uh, so these model variants within a specific service type. So GoRide is our ride-hailing uh, service type, but we had many different service types that we were expanding to. So we had food delivery, um, which also needs allocation. We have logistics. We have ride-hailing on cars. And they all have their own different models because it's trained on different data. So um, we were expanding rapidly into all these service types. And then we're also expanding into new markets. So we're expanding into Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam as well. So quickly, the amount of models and systems grew exponentially. And um, you can't just duplicate these models and just serve from a single endpoint. Um, for example, in Thailand, there are very strict reg regulations on what taxi um, motorcycle taxis are allowed to do. So a lot of logic goes into these systems. It's not just an XGBoost or a PyTorch. There's actual business logic that gets written into these deployments. So the way we managed um, to scale out our systems was through uh, the approach of uh, essentially GitOps and infrastructure as code. So we roll out all our infrastructure across all of our VPCs and regions um, through Terraform. And we even just install a lot of our uh, Kubernetes manifests and components through Terraform using the Helm provider. And that, that maintains that state for us. And so it's uh, a, a lot easier to reason about and, and to scale out. And then we deploy our applications through a CD system, through GoCD. And ultimately, everything is version controlled. Um, and we always have a good context of our uh, of our systems. And this is also highly portable, right? We can easily spin up and destroy a, a region if we wanted to. 
There's also a good link here by one of our um, tech leads on the data engineering team if you guys wanted to check that out. So once you have this, once you've version controlled everything and you've scaled to all these markets, then you get some other uh, great benefits as well. So imagine you're training a model or you're using Kupa pipelines. What you can do is you can, um, you can track the inputs to that, that pipeline. You can track the version of the pipeline. And you're going you're you're to have a bunch of artifacts that are being produced. So you're training, let's say, one model. But all of your processes are creating artifacts. You're create, from source code, you're creating Docker images. In Git, you've got your configuration stored. And all of these artifacts together can, can be monitored through their stores. And um, you, can, you can produce a unique version of, all the, of a combination of these artifacts and then create a deployment. And this is what we're doing now. So whenever one of these artifacts changes, we are updating the deployed system. And this is a very scalable approach uh, across all of our markets. And the biggest benefit to this is that ultimately you can tie your um, experimental outcome to the unique combination of artifacts that went into that specific deployment. So it allows you to reason about why a deployment worked or didn't work. And then to add to this, what we're focusing on now and what the Kubeflow team is looking at now is metadata management. How can you go, how can you track all the metadata across this life cycle and then go up stream when you discover something went well or didn't go well and then it gives you more context about that. So just to cover the good parts that we discussed earlier, um, the, the ecosystem currently for ML and Kubernetes is vibrant, and that's one of the biggest draws for us, especially with Kubeflow, bringing together all these, these packages and components and frameworks. The consistent API that Kubeflow, Kubernetes provides is a great uh, way to extend and build a platform, so in, in our case, our ML platform. The uh, workloads, uh, it, it, there's also a great benefit to running workloads on Kubernetes because of its intelligent resource scheduling and utilization. Um, having everything centrally deployed on a Kubernetes cluster is also one of the great benefits. And then once you follow a GitOps-based approach and you're versioning and tracking all of the artifacts um, that go into a deployment, uh, you can easily um, in introduce tracing and an ability to reason about and explain your experiments. So what still sucks? Multi-tenancy is still pretty bad. Um, we don't have a good way to expose Kubernetes clusters to our data scientists. And some of them are very full stack. They're very strong engineers. Uh, so finding the balance between introducing um, or breaking that abstraction or not is, is quite tough. Stateful systems are still kind of a challenge running DBs in, in Kube. We tend to opt for the, uh, managed services for databases right now using Google Cloud. And there's still some leaky abstractions in terms of when you're um, asking data scientists to write annotations, for example. And coming up next, we are focusing on the end user experience. So we focused on building the platform for uh, capabilities in terms of running prod systems that are complex and scale out and drive big impact. But we want to address um, the long tail of customers that are throughout our organization because we have thousands of employees. And we're also focusing on metadata tracking, like I said earlier, and also integrating Istio uh, tracing into our stack. And I'll leave you on this quote from Kelsey Hightower, which I think is very applicable. At least in our experience, building an ML platform, building an ML platform on top of Cube really made sense. Um, th thank you very much, Willem. That's a really great introduction and motivation for uh, Kubeflow. Because um, what we realized talking to a lot of companies and customers is that Gojek wasn't alone in building uh, a platform for machine learning and using Kubernetes. Lots of people were doing that same thing. You know, and they, as William mentioned, you know, they built a custom resource lasso internally for doing uh, a graphs of inference of models. When there were companies outside that, like Selden, doing the exact same things. And many of those companies have presented here at KubeCon. And so what we decided to, to do is we said, why not create an open platform for machine learning on Kubernetes that everyone could contribute to and everyone could use? And that's what Kubeflow is. It's an open Kubernetes native platform for ML. Our mission is basically to make it easy for everyone to develop, deploy, and manage portable distributed ML on Kubernetes. So we'd like to give you a demo of what that looks like. And what we would like to show you is that using Kubeflow and Kubernetes, you can build the same types of workflows that companies like Gojek are using in production, right? So workflows like their driver allocation uh, 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 workflow. Um, and so what we're going to show you is we're going to show you how you can use Feast, um, which to uh, keep track of your features and load, them in, uh, load your features there. And that's going to allow your data scientists to rapidly develop and iterate on models. And 
And we're going to show you how they can do that using notebooks running on Kubeflow uh, use, uh, on top of Kubernetes. And so after we've developed our model, we're going to take advantage of uh, Faring, which is a library in Kubernetes that's going to make it really easy for your data scientists to deploy their models on Kubernetes without sort of having to learn all those uh, Kubernetes concepts like pods, uh, 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 services, and deployments. And then finally, as, you, as we saw from uh, Willem's talk, you often want to build these pipelines that can uh, define these multi-step workflows. And we're going to show you how you can do that uh, in uh, Kubeflow pipelines. So with that, I'm going to switch over to the demo. So this is the central dashboard for uh, Kubeflow. And so the idea is that we're going to deploy and manage a bunch of applications for machine learning on Kubernetes, right? And so after you've logged into Kubeflow, you can use this dashboard to navigate between all the different applications. And right now, we basically have three applications. We have notebooks. Sorry. That's the docs. This is notebooks. We have uh, Catib, which is our, our hyperparameter tuning system. Um, and then we have pipelines. We also have a bunch of components like custom resources for training and deploying models, but those don't necessarily have UIs, so I'm not showing them right now. Um, so let's go to notebooks, right? So from here, we can see all of our notebooks that we have running, and so we make it really easy for data scientists to launch and run, manage multiple notebooks simultaneously so they could have different environments, maybe one for PyTorch, maybe one for TensorFlow, and maybe one's running some long-running job and they can work in another one. And so to launch a notebook, they just click here on New Server, and they have a simple web UI where they can fill out um, a form in order to launch a notebook. So they just give it a name, and then they can specify the Docker image they want to use. We ship a bunch of stock runtime environments for, for ML, but you can also build uh, custom Docker images that have uh, you know, the libraries that you need installed. And then you can fill out the resources that you need, and you can even attach volumes if you have to attach extra data, sh data system, uh, storage systems like an NFS share. So <clears throat> after you've done that, you can go ahead and uh, connect to your notebook. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the notebook I've already started up. And so this is a notebook that we're going to use for our demo. And so in this demo, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the Chicago Taxi Cab data set, which is a data set that's used in a lot of ML research um, and ex ex examples, and it's basically a data set of Chicago taxi rides. It's got various features about those taxi rides, such as duration, pickup time, delivery uh, uh, destination, and then uh, uh, fare cost, how much the taxi ride costs. And so what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to use these features to predict how much a taxi ride's going to cost. Let me zoom in. How's that font size? Can people see that? OK, we're good? All right. So I'm going to scroll down here. Uh, where is it? So, so here what we're doing is um, we're going to load some data set, load some data from a, a CSV file that contains the Chicago taxi cab data set. And so in this case, we're just loading it into a Pandas data frame. So um, we're going to load this data into Feast. That's mostly to illustrate how you can actually go about uh, loading data into Feast. Uh, in practice, you'd be continually streaming or ingesting your data from like your logs um, into your uh, data store, uh, Feast. But we wanted to sort of illustrate this aspect of Feast for you. So after we've loaded that data, what we're doing here is we're basically computing some derived features where we're basically using pandas and, and data frames to combine several features um, and compute some other features but, and, uh, that we're going to load into the uh, data store. And so down here, this is where we start to define an importer to actually import the data into Feast. And I'm going to turn it back over to Willem to basically describe what's happening here. So what the importer is doing is it's taking a data frame as an input, and then it allows you to define some information about the entity, which in this case is the right. And um, it allows you to define the mapping of the columns within that data frame to features that exist within the feature store. And if they don't exist, then you can specify, you can see it says apply features. It'll actually create those features the first time you run this import. So when you run this, it's going to start a job in the background, and it's going to load in all of those features. And like Jeremy said, in production, this would probably be at the end of an ETL, or you'd run a similar job that's long running to streaming data constantly from a stream. And so your feature store is always being updated with new data. And if you go down a little bit, you'll see, OK, it's creating all of these features within, um, within the feature store. I just want to scroll down a little bit. 
Right, and then you get to the most important part, which is defining your feature set. And this is what is going to allow us to create, to provide us with a way to um, get consistency between our training and serving. So in this case, we're defining a feature set, which is a list of features by their uh, ID. And then we're going to create an object out of that. That's part of the SDK. And then we're going to materialize a data set. So we're going to retrieve the features from the training store. And if you, you'll see that we did a head there, and it's, it's the same data that we just ingested. And, and, and this, is, this is what the, the feature store provides for you. It allows you to query over a time range and, and pull out and materialize that data for training. And importantly, it, it, you're going to use that feature set again, that list of features for, um, on the serving side. So this is typically where a data scientist would start off with building a model. So if you've tasked your data scientists with you know, building a model to solve some problem, um, you know, such as predicting fares, the first thing they would do is they would go ahead and load that you know, bunch of features from you know, their data store like Feast. Um, and then they would try to visualize that data in order to see, you know, is there a signal there that I can use to solve this problem? And so to, to do that, we're going to use um, TensorFlow data validation. So this is one of the many applications that's in TFX, which is uh, a set of applications that Google is open sourcing and releasing to enable you to build complex ML systems. And so what TFDB does is it will go through your data set and compute various statistics. And then it provides a nice handy uh, widget. I think it's based on facets that allows you to uh, visualize those statistics, right? So here we're looking at you know, various columns like uh, passenger count, and it's printing out some various statistics. Um, and then we can visualize things like the distribution. And it's interactive, so you can you know, change those settings to view them differently. And so one of the reasons I wanted to show that is one of the questions we get most in uh, Kubeflow is how is TFX and Kubeflow related to one another? And the answer is that you know, they work really well together. With Kubeflow, we're trying to uh, make it really easy to run TensorFlow uh, TFX on uh, Kubernetes so you can leverage those uh, applications as part of your workflows. So after we've done that, then we can go down here and we can start to define the code to train our model. And so here's the training code. Um, and so you can see down here we actually, um, where's my pointer? There we go. Um, we load the, the data from Feast. And here what we're doing is we're specifying the time range that we want to uh, download so we can specify like the last 28 days. And then we're going to download the features that were defined by our, our, our feature set that uh, Willem just showed. And then over here we're actually defining our training code. And in this case we're just building a simple linear model to predict the fares from the features we defined. And then down here we have the predict code. And what the predict code is doing is it's taking in the ID that's identifying the, the taxi ride. And then from Feast we're going to load that features. So you can see we're just calling get serving data. And here we're going to load in the same features that we were using in training. And then we're going to feed that data into our linear model. So the most important thing is the, what you don't see here. So what you don't see here is a lot of complicated code to go and fetch these features, these different features from multiple different databases, um, and pre, uh, compute the, the features from the raw data. And so as Willem uh, mentioned before, that allows us to avoid the training uh, serving uh, skew, because we're getting, using the same uh, features in training as in serving. And that's because of we're using Feast to take care of that. So after we've done that, we can go ahead and um, train our model inside our notebook. So here we're just in invoking uh, train. Um, well, it seems like my notebook's having problems. Um, anyways, and then we can go on and call prediction. Um, and we can invoke it inside the notebook. Um, and then one thing that would happen is after you've built your model and you've iterated on your model inside the notebook, um, you'd like to go ahead and maybe scale out on Kubernetes. Um, so you can imagine if you're training on a very small data set so that you can train quickly and iterate, once you've got a model that you're happy with, you might want to go ahead and launch that as a long-running job on Kubernetes maybe you, and maybe you know, process the full data set. So maybe you've been training only on the last 28 days, and now you want to go and train on all of your data, maybe for the last year. So in this case, we can use fairing to easily launch a training job on Kubernetes. So to do that, all we have to do is um, specify two, two values. One is the Docker image that we want to use. Um, and so in this case, we're going to use the same runtime environment as we're using our notebook for our notebook, so we can get uh, the same environment as we're using in our notebook. 
And then the other thing we have to specify is the Docker image where uh, we want to push the, push the image. And then with fairing, we just have to call one simple line, which is uh, uh, a couple lines of Python code to build uh, the image. And what fairing is going to do is it's going to take our notebook, convert it to uh, Python code, and then build and push a Docker image. Um, we can then just invoke a couple lines of Python code to actually launch a Kubernetes job. Um, and then fairing will actually go and uh, fetch the logs from that Kubernetes job and print them out for convenience. And we can actually call out to Kubernetes to print out the actual Kubernetes job that we actually submitted and ran. And so we can see we just have the expected uh, spec for Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes job. Um, once we've trained our model, we, we might want to actually go ahead and deploy that on Kubernetes to get a RESTful endpoint that we can call. So in this case, we can again use fairing to automatically launch, a, build and launch a deployment on Kubernetes. Um, and that's just another couple lines of Python code to deploy that. And then you can see we printed out the endpoint that we're getting uh, inside our cluster to actually do predictions. Um, and then finally, as, as William showed, we might want to develop a complex pipeline to run multiple steps and to make it easy to repeat all these steps. So for that, we can use Kubeflow pipelines. And so to de define a pipeline, you know, we just define a function, which we're going to use to define the steps in our pipeline. And we add this simple annotation to let Kubeflow pipelines know this is actually a pipeline. Then inside the pipeline, we just define the steps of our pipeline. Each step in a pipeline is going to run a containerized operation. So basically, it's going to spin up a pod. And so all we have to do is specify the image we want to use. And so in this case, we're going to use the same images we used for training and deploying um, and that were created by fairing. And then we just specify the, uh, uh, the, the command that we want to invoke. And so in this case, we can just tell it that we want to run training. And then we can tell it what time range of data that we actually want to train on. And we can pass that as command line arguments. Sorry. And then to actually submit it, the pipeline, we can just um, call out to the, the uh, Kubeflow Pipelines SDK. And that will go ahead and submit the pipeline and print out a link. And we can open that link to see that pipeline running in uh, Kubeflow Pipelines. And so in this case, we have a very simple uh, pipeline where we're just pre-processing and training and then validating the data. So the key takeaway is that you know, using Kubeflow, you can begin to build these complex workflows just like uh, Gojek is doing. Um, and, these are gonna, and using Feast as your feature store, you can rapidly iterate and deploy models into production. So just a couple quick words about uh, Kubeflow. So um, this is kind of the motivation for Kubeflow. So if you're building uh, Kubeflow, uh, ML pipelines, it's a complex workflow uh, that you have of multiple steps that you go through to de build and deploy ML into production. So you have data ingestion, you have training, you have deploying. For each of these uh, steps in your process, you have multiple applications that you could choose from. So for example, for serving, you could be using uh, TensorFlow Serving. You could be using uh, NVIDIA's Inference Server. So with Kubeflow, we're trying to make it very easy to run these applications on Kubernetes and then uh, combine them into complex workflows. Um, we have three core tenants. You know, one is composability. So as you saw from our, our demo, we want to make it super easy to take different applications like Feast and TFX and combine them into complex workflows. We're also very interested in scalability, so we want to make it super easy for users to scale out, um, you know, either by running multiple jobs or running jobs with you know, large amounts of resources. And then finally, uh, portability. Um, we want to make it super easy to run anywhere that Kubernetes runs, and that's one of the, re uh, and that's one of the advantages of using Kubernetes is that it runs in the cloud and on-prem. So this is a quick d diagram of what uh, Kubeflow looks like, the architecture. We basically have a bunch of uh, uh, shared applications and um, custom controllers that run in a, in a shared namespace. But then all users can deploy and consume Kubeflow in their own namespace. Um, so they can run pipelines and, and notebooks in their own namespace. And then we expose all these services behind an ingress um, so that you can access them from outside the cluster. As I mentioned before, we are an open source project and we have, a, we, are, we have a lot of momentum and a lot of great contributions from outside, the from within the community. So we have over 30 companies participating and we're growing rapidly as these graphs show. So in the last 28 days, we've had almost 500 PRs 
and uh, our number of contributors keeps growing, and we have about 80 unique contributors in the last 80 days, uh, 20, 28 days. Um, and finally, you know, our, our motto, so to speak, is we want to have a low bar, so make it super easy for people to get started with machine learning on Kubernetes, um, but then we want to have a very high ceiling, so we don't want to limit what people can do uh, with machine learning on Kubernetes. Um, and so finally, I think it would be great if you went to the uh, Kubeflow docs page and followed our getting started guide to try out Kubeflow. Um, you can also go to uh, the Feast website uh, and follow the instructions to installing Feast. Um, and if you go to this uh, GitHub page, you can actually download the demo uh, that we showed you today and go through it yourself. Uh, there's a lot of great talks to here at uh, KubeCon about Kubeflow. Um, you might want to consider checking out some of the videos or materials online. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any time left for questions, but maybe we can try for one if anybody has a quick one. The question was, what is the store used for inference for the features? In, in production, the serving store. In our case, we have a choice between Redis or Bigtable. In this case, it's Redis. Yes. One more quick question. All right. Are you planning to insert some uh, JDBR of security in the feature store, starting to manage uh, all these uh, applications and uh, manage? I think that's definitely on the cards, but it's not a priority for us right now. It's a still early stages for this software project, so. Um, we're open to PRs if you want to contribute. All right. Thank you very much. We'll be outside if anybody has any other questions.